Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can spend time in your word, spend time in your presence. Father, we ask that we would be able to put aside our worries, our cares, our concerns for the day, and simply spend time with you. We thank you, Lord, that you reach out to us, and we thank you, Lord, that you inspire us to be in your presence. With Christ, we pray and we ask. Amen. We're continuing through John chapter 7, and we're watching Jesus. He's hanging out, you might recall, at the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles. He was asked before going to make a grand entrance, make a big deal of himself showing up, come in a parade, so to speak, and he decides not to. We saw that people are talking about him and arguing about him, and so partway through the festival, he finds himself speaking publicly. When we looked at those verses last time, we skipped over a couple of verses, 19 and 20, which read, Has not Moses given you the law? Yet no one of you keeps the law. Why are you trying to kill me? That's Jesus speaking. And then you're demon-possessed, the crowd answered. Who is trying to kill you? We skipped this whole part last week. The crowd in question there is thinking that Jesus has come off the deep end, so to speak. His assessment that people are trying to kill him makes no sense to them, and they call him out on it. As readers, of course, we know that he's right. We know the stories from earlier where people were going to try to kill him. They understood the threat that he posed to the status quo and the powers that were, and, and so they knew that they had to get rid of him. The crowd, as we know in the story, has gathered from all over Israel, come into Jerusalem. They've come from far and wide. News didn't travel the same way then, right? There, there wasn't newspapers, there wasn't Twitter. And so you couldn't know what was going on in quite the same level. And it's important to know that because in the reading we did this morning, a new group shows up. And they're only in a very few stories in Scripture. They're rarely spoken of. In verse 25, it said, at that point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask. Now, some of your Bibles are going to say the Jerusalemites. That's okay, too. The point being that these are not just the crowd. This isn't just the people that came from all over the place who may or may not know what's going on. This is the people in Jerusalem. It's kind of like insider baseball. Like when we grew up in Ottawa, Everybody knew the governor general, and you can kind of name some cabinet ministers and stuff, right? That's kind of normal. When we went to BC, the average person has no idea who the governor general is. They can tell you the prime minister, and that's about it because they don't care. They're not from here. It's not important to them. Their newspaper is not full of cabinet news the way the Ottawa citizen is. Similarly, in the story, people in Jerusalem know what's going on at a different level. So you had the crowd, they don't understand that Jesus is a threat, they don't think anybody's trying to kill him, and now we've got the Jerusalemites who know full well the story of how some people feel threatened by Christ, and they want to see him gotten rid of. They are mostly a group of people trying to decide what do they believe, which side are they on, the authorities or this Christ figure, it's maybe still up in the air, but they are fully aware of what's going on. Their options at this point are binary. You can side with Jesus and his bizarre claim to divinity, his bizarre claim to be a long-awaited Messiah, or you could side with the authorities who saw Jesus as nothing but a blasphemous, heretical crank, something of a rabble-rouser who must be quieted because he poses a threat to the careful equilibrium the Jews have set. The Jewish leaders at the time are trying to keep their heads down, keep their noses clean, stay out of trouble with the Romans as best they can, just be quiet and hope for the best. And here's this Jesus bringing crowds, rabble-rousing, getting them excited, and the people in charge of Jerusalem want nothing to do with it because they know how violent the Roman Empire is, and they don't think Jesus has the ability to protect them from it. So here's Jesus, and he's publicly speaking. All of that's going on. The Jerusalemites know that some people want this guy dead, and yet he's being allowed to speak publicly in prominent places, and nobody's stopping him. How are they supposed to understand what's going on in front of them? John tells us their reaction. Here he is speaking publicly, and they're not saying a word to him. Have the authorities really concluded that he is the Messiah? 
Like maybe, just maybe, the people in charge have heard enough and seen enough from Jesus that they've come to his side. Maybe. We know that as time goes on, more and more people are getting closer and closer in the story to thinking Jesus just might be who he says he is, and that the people closest to him are getting more and more certain that he's somehow the very son of God, this long-awaited Messiah. Now, one of the dynamics in the story, I think, worth pausing and noticing is how many of us will have experienced something like this. Like when I was younger, I got to the point, like many teenagers do, that you think the faith makes no sense. You got to be kind of silly or foolish or, you know, not intellectually rigorous if you're going to buy into any faith at all. And then you encounter people like C.S. Lewis, you encounter people like Tim Keller, like Alistair McGrath, you encounter people that run the National Institute of Health in America who are Christians, and you start to think maybe there's more to it. You realize some of the brightest and kindest folks you know are also in the faith, even if they're quiet about it. And as you meet and as you read, you come to realize the faith is more credible. The people in the story here, they're wondering, are the authorities, the people they respect, the people they look up to, starting to think the faith in Christ is credible? And one of the interesting things, and I don't want to put pressure on you, but I want to encourage you, is that people are watching you. And they're being influenced by you. And they're seeing how faith is mattering to you. They're recognizing the kingdom of God in you, for better or worse, right? And God works through us. He works through you. He works through me. He works through the misunderstanding leaders in the story to draw people into faith. One of the challenges of being the Messiah character that Jesus faces, though, is that it's not that clear how you would identify him. Today, we inherit the whole Bible. We can see the whole Bible. We get study Bibles and all the rest of it with commentaries and stuff. And so we think we know what the Messiah is supposed to be, who he's supposed to be, what he's supposed to do, how it's supposed to look, what the impact's supposed to be. But it's hard to tease that out with what's going on here. Because it's not that obvious to the people in his time what they're waiting for. Steven Rensberger is one of many theologians who argues there was no single uniform messianic doctrine among the Jews in antiquity. So there was no checklist of messianic credentials. What that means is that people are trying to understand Jesus. They're confused. And he can't just check a bunch of boxes to prove he is who he says he is. I think we got to cut people slack when they're not understanding what's happening here. Let's jump to our day for a moment. How do we understand the day we're in? Some people are absolutely certain that a certain former president of America was a sign of the end of times. Others believe quite, quite truly and sincerely that they can look at a specific statue and break down the eras of humanity by staring at this statue and they say we're now at the feet and we're at the end of time. Some people thought 2012 was going to be like a really big deal. It gets difficult to understand the times you're in when you're trying to really grapple with this stuff. Back then, people knew there was some kind of Messiah to come. They didn't agree on what that meant. When he came, some said he would appear suddenly as if from nowhere and change everything. Others thought he would be on the scene But only when Elijah came in some fashion that everybody would recognize would he be revealed. Others thought that the Messiah was going to come from Bethlehem and be well known to come from Bethlehem. In all likelihood, there were even more expectations than these, but they couldn't all be done at the same time. You can't suddenly pop onto the scene while also waiting around for Elijah. You can't be from Bethlehem and also be from an unknown origin. In verse 27, it says, we know where this man is from. When the Messiah comes, no one will know where he's from. That wasn't necessarily what everybody thought. So for some people, that meant he can't be Messiah. For others, it meant he was. You see the problem? You can't can't be everything to everybody. So as some of the people in the know, these people in Jerusalem, they're having a hard time believing Jesus is the Christ, despite his own words, despite his demonstrations of power, despite the followers, and despite seemingly authorities acquiescing because they have their own expectations they're watching for and jesus may or may not be meeting them right now mostly he's not 
He's not coming on the scene big enough or grandiose enough. He's coming from the wrong place. Or maybe they don't know where he's from. And he's failing to meet the under, their, their expectations of what's supposed to happen. Now that happens today too, right? What are our expectations of a savior or of a good loving God? So far as we can tell, this will often pull us away from the faith when God fails to do what we hope for him to do. For instance, we often like to think we know what's best. We look at a broken world. You can watch the news any day of the week, and you'll see that if there was a perfect God and he was perfectly powerful and perfectly good, then these stories we see on the news just wouldn't happen, right? But when we say that kind of stuff, what we're doing is we're putting ourselves above God. We're judging the events. We're judging the divine and finding both wanting as though our vision, our understanding, our explanations are the only possible ones, and they're obviously right. Now, to some extent, that's fair. The world is a broken place, and there's a lot of pain that needs accounting for. But if you read the Bible, you see that in Genesis, right at the very beginning of the Bible, it says the world is cursed. It's not the way it's supposed to be. And so you better expect that. The Bible doesn't promise everything's going to be awesome all the time right here, right now. It promises that God loves creation. God promises to redeem creation and has the power to redeem it in ways we don't understand. When we place the sort of critique that God is beneath us, we're ignoring these elements of the Bible that say, no, 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 don't expect that yet. And yet expect that one day. C.S. Lewis argued that the fact that we know things are wrong suggests there is a way for things to be right. He uses this famous example of a meal, and he says, no matter how great a meal I have, there's always this better meal just off on the horizon. And that fact that I think that means that that meal exists, I just have to wait for it. It's not going to happen in this life. The idea that there's this more perfect society, this more peaceful society, is what we're made for, is actually a hint of what's to come. Now, Paul the Apostle puts it this way. He says, you're in the world, but you're not of the world. Because we are made for this perfected version that Christ will usher in one day. And we don't want to think we're there yet because we're not. What does Jesus do or say in response to the challenge in the story? N.T. Wright sums it up well, so I'm just going to use him. He says, Jesus' reply is not what we expect. We imagine he's going to insist he is the Messiah and to insist as well that they don't know where he has come from. But as so often in the gospel, Jesus goes deeper than we or his hearers expect. He agrees that they do indeed know where he comes from. In other words, he's come from to Jerusalem from Galilee. But instead of saying, as we might have imagined, but you don't know where I'm really from, meaning God, he turns the question around. They are indeed ignorant of something. But their real ignorance is not so much about him, Jesus, but about God. It isn't that they do not know God, or that they do know God, but aren't sure if Jesus comes from God, which is the question. It is rather that they don't even know God, and so naturally cannot associate the Jesus that they are seeing with the true God. The same challenge comes to our world today. Often people look at Jesus and draw conclusions about him based on faulty ideas of God and the world. And the Christian message insists that people must learn afresh who God is, what the world is, and who we ourselves are by looking at Jesus. That is the right way around. The challenge is often needed just as much inside the churches as outside of them. N.T. Wright has spent his life in church. He's a bishop, or he was a bishop. He knows what he's talking about. Inside the church and outside the church, we have the same problem. We have the same challenge. The whole thing reminds me of another story in the gospel, and actually the gospel of Luke chapter 7. You might remember this. John the Baptist sends his students to Jesus, and they say, are you the one we're waiting for? Like, John's going to send everybody off to Jesus if he's who he thinks he is. Many think John is the Elijah character. That wasn't as obvious. 
And then we read this. At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sickness, and evil spirits, and he gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and good news is proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. So when asked, are you who we're waiting for? He says, just look at what I'm doing. And then you decide. He points away from himself. He points towards the kingdom of God. He points towards the effects of the divine working to overcome, overturn the curse. Bringing healing to the broken, making right the injustice. Basically, he's saying, if you know God, then you know that God is the God of the marginalized and the weak. The God who would pick Israel. The God who would make himself known in this small, pathetic group of people and hold them as his people for centuries. No matter what they do, when they leave him, when they abandon him, when they irritate him, when they make him angry, when they get overrun over and over again, when he gives them an easy option and they refuse to take it. He's the God who tells them they better be ready to be concerned for the foreigner, set up whole systems to take care of the foreigner, set up systems to take care of widows, set up systems to take care of orphans, make sure everybody is elevated and coming along. The women and the children matter just as much as the men, which is radical at the time. He says, if you recognize God, you'll know what I'm up to. And people don't like the answer. They're offended because Jesus is calling them out on this matter that's a core of their identity. They believe they are the people of God. And now he's telling them they don't even know God. And that the way they act and the way that they evaluate society shows they don't understand. So John says, at this, they tried to seize him. Right? You turn to violence. Isn't that just human? But no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. His time is going to come. The plots and the timelines of men and the divine are not identical. It's part of the theme that Jesus doesn't meet expectations. He's not doing stuff on our time. Like the people would not know where the Messiah came from, or they would know where he came from. The, the expectations are being blown up. Jesus and God are not required to fulfill all of our expectations. They're not bubblegum machines. They're persons. And we're to be on the lookout for them. The passage ends with these people that recognize Jesus, recognize the miracles he's doing. They say, still many in the crowd believed in him. They said, now remember, back to the crowd, not the Israel, the Jerusalemites, the crowd is coming on board. When the Messiah comes, will he perform more signs than this man? Like Moses, who performed powerful acts in the wilderness, acts over creation, acts of liberation. Jesus is demonstrating a power over the elements, the sea. He's offering this ability to liberate people from demons, from sickness. They had hoped that he would remove the Romans the way Moses took them away from Egypt. His, the expectations are always on display. And yet they see something that's going on, don't they? This last line might be an allusion of some sort to the work that Jesus had pointed out to John the Baptist. It might be a hint to us about our theological arguing that we also love. How many angels can dance on the head of a pin? What does kenosis really mean? I got in trouble in seminary because I basically refused to write this paper about the kenotic Christology because I argued that it, it would take me a long time and I, I suspected I could be a minister for 45 years and nobody was going to come to my office and say, could you define kenotic Christology for me? And I had other stuff to do. The secondary to the work of the kingdom of God. They're important. They're not unimportant, but they're secondary. The work of the kingdom of God that Jesus is pointing to is stuff like shelters for battered women, offering safe haven, education, resume help. 
stuff like food banks that make sure people can survive, addiction services, groups helping people fight their own demons while retaining their humanity, hospitals that care for the weakest and poorest people in the world, water offered to the parched, maybe vaccines. I'm not that smart, but I find it a bit interesting that America is donating vaccines to Canada of all places, like we're a charity suddenly. A church, a kingdom of God, offering spiritual direction to people who are affluent but lost. A hug for the people who are depressed or anxiety ridden. A meal at the table in the sanctuary where everybody comes equally broken. It doesn't matter who you are or what you did this week. John ends the story with still many in the crowd believed in him. They said, when the Messiah comes, will he perform more signs than this man? And they're asking it rhetorically. They're not saying they think he will. They're saying he is. Now, one of the things I've learned about ministry is a lot of ministers burn out. Almost everybody I know has been on medical leave of some sort for all kinds of reasons. And one of the big disappointments I think that ministers are facing is that we rarely see lives changed like this. The addicted set free is messy. It takes a long time. It goes up, it goes down, it goes down, it goes down, it goes down, and then maybe it goes up a little bit. The sick being healed, the widow cared for, the orphan raised up and somehow invested in, we don't see this that much. The signs that people hope and expect for. There's a story of a guy who was very interested in church. He had never been to one. Read the Bible, read it and read it. Somehow he'd come across this. And so he went to this big church in New York. And he sat through the whole thing and the preaching and the music. And he was all involved. And on the way out, he said to the minister, is that it? The minister said, well, yeah, that was pretty good. There's like 5,000 people here. Like, it was a big thing. Uh, and the kid says, well, like, when do the exorcisms happen? When, when are the people going to get healed? When's the addicted guy going to get off the porn? <laughs> we have expectations and hopes and dreams, and it's good that we do. When I read a passage like this, I feel like we're all called to humility, though. Like, I don't always know what's best for my kids. I really don't always know what's best for a congregation. I don't know what's best for the community we live in all the time. I can't tell you if Ottawa's new city plan makes any sense. I can barely even read it. But it's okay because God is ultimately in charge. Like, God knows what's happening, knows where we're headed, and has promised we're going to get there, despite our best and worst efforts. We are simply called to listen to him, to see where he's calling, to watch for where he's at work in the world, and just jump on board with that, and do our very best. We're in a broken and confusing world, and we all want to be on the side of justice, of mercy, of love, of patience, gentleness, kindness, and that means being on the side of Jesus however and wherever he chooses to work, however you're going to understand him. He's calling you to find him at work. A few moments ago, we read Psalm 100. I'm going to read it again. Think about what it means to actually be somebody saying this with intention, with meaning, with purpose. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Imagine a time of pandemic. If we could all shout for joy, what does that mean? Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. What happened to you this week? What are you worried about? What are you nervous about? Come and enter with thanksgiving. Come to his courts with praise place where you're to be judged with praise give thanks to him and praise his name for the lord is good his love endures forever his faithfulness continues throughout all generations no matter how messed up 
no matter how wacky. On Father's Day, you might want to remember that. If you have the types of fathers that some people have, you need to know that God's love works anyways. I'm going to pray that that would be true for us. Some people have a hard time with Father's Day. We know this. Some people's dads were not very dad-like. Other people want to be dads and they don't get to be dads for all kinds of reasons. And so it can be difficult. It can be good for some of us, but it can be hard. There's also those of us who lost our dad this year and haven't been able to grieve properly with our friends and our family because of COVID. And so we'll take a minute. We're going to pray that we can see the kingdom of God at work even there. Let's pray together. Lord, would we recognize you at work in our lives? Would we recognize you at work in our family? Whatever it looks like. Lord, teach us to forgive if that's what's needed. Comfort us or give us peace if that's what's needed. Lord, you know what our church needs. You know what our community needs. You know what our world needs. Lord, would you work in and through us that we would be part of showing your world that your love really does endure forever, that your faithfulness is good and true, and that these promises of this better time, this better era, are going to come to fruition. Lord, and help each of us as we encounter you, that we would know Christ, know him on the cross, and know him resurrected from the empty grave. Lord, only you can provide us with this inspiration. And so we pray that you would give us the insights of those people at the end of the story who are seeing the work of Christ and recognizing him in it. We give you thanks. We give you praise that you want to hear us and that you want to be with us through Christ and with Christ. Amen. Amen.